Underground rock music from the Soviet Union. The singers are Russian, but the boogie woogie is in English. Known as Ruslish, the English language is infiltrating the Iron Curtain from Britain and the United States. Words like rock music, sex appeal, jeansy, hooligan, shoozy, and even disc jockey. Superpower politics divide east from west. But for English, there are no borders. It is more influential than any language the world has ever known. This is the story of English and an English-speaking world. There is only one language for airlines taking off and landing in 157 countries around the world. And that's English. Hello? Milano? English is the universal language of air traffic control. Coming from London to Fiumicino. Alitalia 305, buonasera, Reda Contact. Proceed as clear. Geneva, bonsoir from Alitalia 305. So an Italian pilot flying an Italian jet into Italian airspace contacts Italian ground control speaking only in English. Alitalia 305, descent to flight level 130. Scattered around the world by air travel and tourism, it's estimated that well over a thousand million people make some use of British or American English every day. Half the world's telephones ring in English-speaking countries. English is used in 75% of telexes and telegrams. and letters and postcards delivered around the world. It's the language of more than half of the world's 10,000 newspapers and of 3,000 publications in India alone. Calcutta, Paris, Athens, Jerusalem, Cairo, Buenos Aires, Tokyo and Tehran all have English papers. In news, English dominates the world's airwaves which is why Iranians demonstrate in English. American English is the language of the world's movies. Jazz and pop and rock and roll are all sung in British or American English, even by Swedes or Poles. Over half of a recent European hit parade had songs in English, some of them from Germany. Other valuable commodities like silver, tin, platinum, and titanium are traded in English. And so is the hard currency of information. 80% of the world's computer data is in English. The TV satellites have already begun to saturate the world's small screens with programs in English. It is a language without frontiers.
Ironically, English, the world language, is still alien to parts of the British Isles. On Barra, in the Scottish Hebrides, the first language is still Gaelic. Most people here in Barra speak Gaelic. They speak Gaelic. All my family at home speaks Gaelic. This castle is the ancestral home of an old Scottish family, the Clan MacNeil. My name is also MacNeil, Robert MacNeil. My branch of the clan left Scotland four generations ago and settled in the United States and Canada. I was brought up in Halifax, Nova Scotia and educated in Canadian schools. The way I speak English is a product of that background, modified by 30 years as a journalist in Britain and the United States. Like the people of Barra, people throughout the British Isles, in North America and around the world, we all speak varieties of English determined by our backgrounds. That's the word we try to use in this series, variety, not dialect, which is often a loaded word. Our story is not about the correct way to speak English, but about all the different varieties and how they came to be. Why a MacNeil in Nova Scotia sounds different from a MacNeil here in Scotland or one in North Carolina or New Zealand. Varieties of English are as old as the language itself. In fact, the idea of a correct or proper way to speak is surprisingly recent. There is such an idea, of course. It's often referred to as the Queen's English or BBC English or Oxford English or public school English. Public school English is barely a hundred years old. It first echoed round the playing fields of schools like Eton, Harrow and Winchester. In Victorian England, these boarding schools took boys from many backgrounds and gave them the same accent. You had a kind of unnatural segregation of a subset of the people of the country, the very people who were going to become the most powerful. Because of their position of power, they were the basis of imitation. They were eminent and eminently imitable, as it were. The presumed superiority of this accent lingers. Research in Britain shows that people using this accent are thought more intelligent, more trustworthy, even better looking. Its influence is declining, but the inculcation of public school English still goes on in schools like Winchester. Well, I think anyone who does have a particularly um, fringe accent, who's right on the borders, would um, firstly be sort of persuaded gradually to sort of to conform with everybody else. Then if he didn't, he'd be ostracised, um, put out, and people would go out of their way to be unpleasant to him, I think. When I first came here, I had a working-class accent, and thus... Um, I was sort of, after a while, I was ridiculed. But you can gradually change your accent, and so that dies away. But undoubtedly, the English public school has had an enormous influence on the dissemination of one variety of English, uh, what I call a super dialect, that is, received standard or BBC.